very pleased to um, introduce the next speaker, uh, Alva Fien. He's a professor at UC Davis um, and director also of the NIH uh, West Coast Metabolomics Center. Very famous, very uh, distinguished, publishes a lot, uh, 18 plus papers this past year, and most of them are actually none of those wacky journals, you know? Um, so, um, some of you know I almost moved there, met him before, and we were doing metabolomics in my lab and proteomics. Olive is one of the reasons we got out of metabolomics because he does it so well, so carefully. I, I thought I'd leave that to him, and he's done an amazing job over the years. Um, one last thing, um, you know, often um, chemistry and biochemistry departments have facilities that um, help the industry and ag industry in California and ag industry here, and some of you know that warfarin came from a chemist helping a farmer, and, um, but uh, mainly we just do uh, uh, cow poop and uh, cheese now. Uh, that's a joke, that's not true. But it brings me to one of the papers, two of his papers that I really like. Uh, one was done a couple decades ago where he did uh, untargeted MS, I believe, with wine, white wine, which I've always loved that paper. And I just noticed another one where you analyze the, um, the um, last meal of a, a very old Iceman, which uh, sounds fascinating too. So um, anyway, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Oliver. Yeah. On. Now it's on. Thank you so much. Um, so proteomics, uh, you have heard a lot about so far. Metabolomics, similar, not identical though. Um, both uh, really have a workflow and both try to get lots of good mass spec data and this is the important part, right? So we really want to solve biomedical uh, or biological or medical uh, problems in order to come with good study design. So we heard about that in the statistics lecture. Um, obviously, I do not talk about biology today, right? So I will talk about a little bit about the workflow. Um, not everything can be covered, so I focus more on the compound identification because that is clearly different between proteomics and metabolomics and clearly a, a, a big bottleneck. But before we go into this workflow, let's, let's look at that. Why do we even want to do metabolomics? Um, and, and I took this uh, figure and I, I, I adapted it from current opinion systems biology uh, where it was on, uh, on precision medicine. And precision medicine is now in, in everybody's um, mouths or so. The NIH talks about it and we talk about it and you put it always in the title and it's good. Um, and what most people understand is you, know, you sequence a lot and then you can derive from those sequences the phenotype, like you know, the prevalence of a disease. It works okay-ish in some uh, diseases like cancer, um, but in most other diseases, it doesn't work that way. In most other diseases, we also have to incorporate the lifestyle. And this is a missing piece of information that actually makes um, biomedical investigations so hard because we can't just say we know the sequence and we go for the phenotype say the disease. And we can't even say we take the, the genes and at the proteome and the metabolome, and then we know the disease. Um, the important part uh, is lifestyle. Um, exercise, uh, diets um, have so much more impact on both the proteome and the metabolome um, than just the genome itself um, that w this is something we need to uh, integrate better. Now, even if we had all this information, um, and then we try to get all these levels of cellular complexity, uh, we still have to do a lot of thinking about where do we analyze, how do we analyze, what do we analyze. Um, the reason why we like the metabolome it is very close to the phenotype. So the purpose of the cell is to make metabolites. Right? Most people think about it as building and burning. Yeah, so you, you know, use small building blocks to build large complex molecules like proteins, DNA. So you need small molecules for that. And also, of course, you eat to get energy. So building and burning is great. Um, and then some people say, well, that is great because we know some things about metabolism already. For example, glycolysis is important. And they say, well, um, you know, 
that's a definite, uh, a, um, a sh small number of metabolites we can look at. So let's just do targeted met analysis of important metabolites, you know, um, sh sugars and, and f fatty acids, maybe, and amino acids, and everything that's in, in, um, in metabolism. And I like to, to think about it as the, this is the map of California. So here's the most important, uh, Sacramento. Uh, Davis is very close to the most important part. Um, and this is where we get the glucose in, right? Also the water, by the way. Um, and then, you know, here um, is, uh, uh, is the pentose phosphate pathway. So that's where the money is earned, right? That's NADPH. Uh, and then we send all our good carbons all the way into water over to Los Angeles where the mitochondria are. So, you know, NADH, TCA cycle, you can actually see it there. And then from there, the energy dissipates. So this is, you can, you can do this um, both in terms of traffic, but also in terms of, you know, maps, and it's certainly in terms of metabolism. And if that was all, I would not be standing here. So this is all nice and clean, but the point is we are missing a lot of things, right? By just this limited, idea of metabolism and small molecules. There are a lot more streets that um, uh, can be covered and should be covered if we really want to understand metabolism and the working of a cell or if we want to understand traffic in this case. So what is there? What is the, what is the metabolome anyway? The proteome is relatively straightforward. Um, you can deduce it from the genome and you add the modifications and you're done. Well, there's a lot of modifications, I understand, you know. Um, but in principle, the metabolome consists of many more than just the classic pathways. So first of all, we live together with a trillion microbes. These microbes do metabolism um, that we can only dream of. We don't even know really what they're doing, but we are li we're living in symbiosis with them. We can't live without. Um, and they uh, metabolize, they also excrete metabolites that go into the bloodstream, for example, in humans, and have effects elsewhere. Then we coined the term epimetabolome. I wanted to have something that sounded PTM, like post-translational metabolites, but just didn't add up scientifically. So, you know, so I couldn't come up with an acronym that, that, that ended in PTM. Um, but the idea is the same. So we have lots and lots of metabolites that are altered, acetylated, methylated, small alterations that really change the function. Actually, often they only become functional this way. The most important aspects are oxylipins. So oxylipins are small oxidized uh, fatty acids um, that then have huge importance as regulators of physiology and regulators of metabolism. So they are not the victims of genetic flow, but they are the actors. And this is also um, uh, true for other compounds like dimethyl arginine, methyl glycine, diethyl spermine, methyl nicotinamide, all these m variants of classic metabolites um, are becoming actors through these um, epimetabolomes. Then, uh, you know, we eat food and we eat not only food for the energy, but also Lots of those compounds are active. For example, in, in red wine, I actually like red wine better than white wine. Um, and we have a red wine paper. Um, you've got to read this, Mike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's resveratrol and makes us live longer, right? As we all know, it binds to sirtuin, which is a transcription factor and uh, happy, happy ever after. That's why we like the red wine, um, oh. one of those things. Um, so there's, you know, many of those compounds, including caffeine, they have receptors, right? And so we receive them and they, they, they have an action. So it's not just building and burning. Then the next thing is damage and repair. There's damage repair um, in DNA, DNA damage repair. There's protein damage repair. There's also metabolite damage repair. We published something like 10 papers about it with a team um, um, in Florida, uh, Andrew Hansen, but also uh, in Chicago. Uh, Chris Henry and, and, and colleagues. Um, so the idea is anything that can break will break. So for example, think about ATP, there's like phosphates that don't really don't like each other. Um, they break apart or you have double bonds that can be hydrated. Um, and if they get hydrated, then you know, the uh, molecule would become uh, dysfunctional and some enzymes have to be coming in. We think that most of the enzymes where we don't ha have the function yet, and that is often up to 70% of the enzymes, of known enzymes and organisms, don't have known functions, right? Um, we think many of those would be damage repair uh, uh, functions in metabolism. I'm also a member of the uh, government's board of the California EPA. California um, is the only state in the United States that has an EPA, an Environmental Protection Agency. 
Um, and we take on um, the part of <laughs> carrying the flag, um, you know, when the nation doesn't, uh, in terms of environmental protections. And in this case, they said, well, look, we have so many chemicals, we can't target all the chemicals, it's impossible, right? And whenever we, we say the so-and-so pesticide is bad, industry will come up with a new pesticide in no time. So it's, uh, you know, uh, we can't win the race, so we have to use untargeted methods. Um, in an intelligent way. So that's why uh, the California EPA also now uses this to find all the exposome compounds, what we are exposed to. So if you think about those now, it's not an easy task anymore. Uh, we can't just make a targeted list and understand everything we see in plasma or in cells. Um, and we, we can't just, you know, look at glucose and aspartate and then, you know, um, understand what, they're, what, what, they're, what, what this is about. So, um, now we come to the methods, so now let's go to the mass spec side. The problem in not only proteomics, but also metabolomics is we have conflicting aims. And similar to statistics, what we heard earlier before, um, you know, you need to think about your study and what are you really trying to do here? And sometimes targeted methods are fine, but often enough, you know, um, you have conflicting, you know, um, aimed, for example, in accuracy. So how much accuracy do I need depends on the statistical design, meaning what is my effect size that I'm looking for? Do I look for something that's tenfold different? Well, that's easy, both statistics as in, in mass spec. Or do I look at a 10% effect where my, my groups are maybe, you know, have a 10% difference in quant quantification? So that really defines the methods you use, right? Obviously. Also speed. If you have 20, I, I sometimes he, see these papers where people say, I have a high throughput, you know, method, and then they show 20 samples. That is not a high throughput method. <laughs> Sorry to break the news. It's, I find it so often in papers, it's very much annoying. High throughput is when you try to get 2,000 samples done in a month. That's high throughput, right? Or maybe in two months, right? Um, coverage. How much co do we really need the whole metabolome? And what is it anyway? It's a, you know, so so that's 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 hard. Now, if you want to have high accuracy, high speed, and high coverage, you cannot have low costs, right? <laughs> you know, so because sometimes people have a budget, and then the budget is so only so much, you know. And then you you know the first question that we usually say is, what do you mean by metabolomics, and what do you really want? Because unlike in proteomics, our molecules can be very big and very small, very lipophilic, very hydrophilic. Um, so it's, we have to divide and conquer. And it's not you know, one method only that we can use. These are the most frequently used methods in our center. Um, complex lipids or lipidomics, biogenic amines, and, and then we dry it down, and then we do the primary metabolism like sugars and, and acids uh, from there. Um, we also have a number of targeted compounds that will not be covered by untargeted methods. So these are untargeted, you know, basically the tip of the iceberg. You can always look more closely, you will find more. Um, but some of them we know they're important. Steroids, testosterone here is important. Um, oxylipids already mentioned. Bile acids are also now known to regulate metabolism elsewhere. Um, so that's why we then add the targeted methods uh, to the untargeted. So overall, just to give you an idea where metabolomics today is, um, you know, we were charged to run against Metabolon in a, in a, in a small study. We get the samples, we were knowing when the meeting is, uh, when they, Metabolon, which is a company in North Carolina, would present that data, so we got two weeks turnaround time from re um, receiving the samples and having the interpretation ready, so that was a fun task. Um, and so we came up with this, this is a mouse, liver, brain, and blood, and we use the lipidomics. Lipidomics is great because it gives you a lot of identified compounds. You always need to do positive and negative ionization. Uh, you always have some compounds that like both, but not many. Um, the same is actually true for hydrophilic interaction, uh, only that because of time we didn't do positive and negative mode in hydrophilic interactions. Um, and then here you see the targets, and the targets didn't have any overlap with any of the other methods. So there's a little overlap here uh, for the biogenic amines and the primary metabolites, for example, amino acids, what we've seen in both cases. But this is where we are, we got over, over a thousand compounds identified, and we do label-free quantification, if you like. All right. And then you get a list of, of identified compounds. Um, and you wonder what they are and how they do. Um, we developed this this interface for you. Everybody can use it as a single ID conversion or batch ID conversion. You put in the names and it spits out the best. Not the, um, 
um, correct ones necessarily, but the best suitable uh, codes and keys so that you can bring this, this information forward into biochemistry, into literature search. Um, of course, it's better if you would not put in a name like caffeine, um, but most of the time that's what chemists do. They, they say, I found caffeine. Well, then they put it into, you know, into tables and so on, and then you later on want to draw um, um, conclusions from there. If you do it this way, you get so-called INCHI keys. An INCHI key is the international chemical identifier key that you see here. It's never longer than that. It's, it's very standardized. It's like a gene code just for chemicals. You have to use it because if you use it, for example, including now in your, in your papers, people will find your papers and know what you're talking about because these these uh, compounds like caffeine, they have sometimes hundreds of pseudonyms. It's very misleading, very difficult. All right, once you have the INCHI key, you can then interrogate all other databases on this planet. All databases have it. Um, and so if we do that, we can also improve our interpretation of metabolomic outputs. This is an example where we downloaded from the NIH Metabolomics Workbench a certain study on non-obese diabetic mice. Um, and the authors had uh, published certain things and we now reuse the data. So this is also a good thing. So we, we, can, we can upload data to databases, we can download them and find new information that was missed by, by, by authors. Um, and, and we use this uh, using ChemRich. ChemRich is an enrichment statistics. So we didn't talk about enrichment statistics before. Enrichment statistics asks the question, uh, how likely is it that within the number of specific molecules or specific proteins or specific genes, another number has been differentially regulated, right? So say, I have 10, molecule, 10 uh, compounds in glycolysis, how likely is it that five of them have a p-value of 0.05? Together, that is, you know, not very likely, right? But if you just use classic uh, univariate statistics, you would easily throw them out in FDR corrections. Um, and that's why we came up with these, uh, you know, enrichment, not we didn't come up, we use enrichment statistics. Um, we came up with the idea to also uh, follow the trend that is set by genetics, also to use chemical enrichments. Chemical enrichment means I take all the, all the uh, metabolites and compare the similarity um, and then we put them into modules. So we don't use pathways because pathways is very ill-defined. Um, depending on which database you look, look at, you know, you have different definitions of even glycolysis, right? Um, so instead we'd say, well, biochemical databases are incomplete, pathways uh, definitions vary. In the most famous um, tool called MetaboAnalyst, um, you know, they, they uh, they use even wrong statistical uh, assumptions. Um, and we now say, well, you know, if we, um, if we, even if we not only use for the very small databases like CAG, but also really large ones like medical subject headings, which is today the largest ones of, of, of pathways, you know, we would still miss 200 identified compounds that we downloaded from the study. So only if we really take the chemistry into account, the chemical structure, to, through the INCHI key, only then we can come up with these medical, uh, uh, these, these groups. And then you'd say, for example, blue downregulated phosphatidylcholines were really downregulated, and unsaturated triglycerides were really upregulated, but also many others, pentoses and so on. A purple would actually mean uh, within that group you have both down and up regulations. All right, so this is what we do in my lab. We, um, and this is what I really want to you know, give you as a take home message is, Anyone can get a sample of plasma. Anyone can run a good L LCMS um, study. That is not difficult. The difficult part is to get this data out in a, in a, in a reasonable way um, and also interpret it. And that's what my, my uh, um, lab focuses on. So we use 18 databases and cool, uh, tools that we have developed and we still host. So we use Amazon uh, cloud services to you know, be able to, to host it so that we don't spend all our uh, uh, time and money on, on servers. So we have tools both for data processing and validation, but also then for compound identification and then tools, repositories where you can use this data. Um, <laughs> and these are the team members. So the first bottleneck in metabolomics, and this is similar to proteomics. 
you have retention time versus mass. You, you know, if you, if you uh, then do the intensity on the MS1 level by color, this is how it looks like. It looks messy, and you easily see <coughs> noise. Here's noise. That's, these are not compounds, right? So you have to denoise your uh, chromatograms. You have to define even what a signal is. That's all the same uh, as in proteomics. Um, and people have used suboptimal tools um, like XCMS. For, long, for the longest time, which always annoyed me because it was not clear in, in denoising compounds and it was not easy to operate. So um, we published three years ago uh, MS Style. MS Style uh, does the adduct, adduct finding, um, all the peak alignments across multiple chromatograms, um, it batch reporting. So if you have uh, 500 chromatograms, it's not a big deal. Um, we have retention time prediction. If you have, for example, lipids, you have a retention time model in a specific. Uh, column, we use retention time uh, prediction there. It uses the isotope abundance for defining elemental compositions in addition to the uh, accurate mass from accurate mass spectrometers. And uh, behind it, you would have libraries, uh, for example, our lipid blast library, so that you can identify them. All in one screen, where now you see this is a lipidomics run. Again, uh, retention time, mass, and the signal intensity. You can zoom into a single you know, peak here. You see the extracted ion chromatogram. You see all the um, ions on that retention time, uh, but also the MSMS and how it aligns with spectra. You can then say, I only want to Id have identified compounds. I really don't care for unknowns. So you just select that and so you download those. Uh, because many people say, well, I compound identification is too difficult. So this is really uh, easy. It works on PCs. It does not work on Macs. So if you have a Mac, you have to install a virtual PC. Um, that is not easy and not nice. And well, there's only so much we can do. Um, and most people have somewhere a PC in the lab anyway. And how does it work? Well, it works for both data-dependent and data-independent analysis. That's where the dial comes from. It was data-independent analysis. That time was really hot. Um, so you know you can go for ranges, but also in the ranges you would find the adducts. Um, within the range, then you can then do the ma mass spec deconvolution. So deconvolution means from all your um, spectra and also from the single ion, uh, or for both for the MS1 and S on the MSMS level, you can get all the um, ions that belong to a compound. That's called mass spec deconvolution in the sense of metabolomics. Um, and here you see an example. You have this uh, smaller peak next on the shoulder of a very, very abundant one. Um, the raw data is uh, very messy, very noisy. And after mass spec deconvolution, you get a much better one, and then you can identify it. So that's all nice. So this is the data processing. Second one is, of course, uh, how, do, how, do we, how do we quantify? I mean, this is um, not only a problem in, in proteomics, but it's definitely a, pro a problem in, in uh, metabolomics. So what we say is there is 250 years of experience in metabolomics. Um, people have quantified small molecules starting with citric acid and tartaric acid like around 1750, right? So we should not forget what 250 years of scientists have done. And what they have done, they said, well, you know, the best thing is you have isotope dilution mass spec. So you have a series of of internal compounds, uh, isotope labeled compounds, you put it into your sample, and then you can really nicely quantify. Well, that's great. You can do it for one compound, you can do it a couple compounds, but you cannot do it on the metabolome scale. On the metabolome scale, people said, what the heck? We do, you know, um, label free and just look at the peak uh, raw values, and then we don't even know what we're talking about, and funnily, we come up with good science. Well, well, well. Yeah, so the problem with that is that mass specs are very temperamental beings. They're different on Mondays and on Fridays, as you all know, right? Um, and they're certainly different in January and June. So if you publish your intensity values and then somebody else would publish another intensity values, you cannot compare the results, right? So if science is about all about rep repeatability and reproducibility, we need to anchor our studies somehow. And, and one way is to say, well, can we just go somewhere in the middle where we have as many internal standards as possible, but not more, um, and use them to a, quantify these compounds, these target compounds, in addition to get a semi-quantification of all the other compounds. And in, in, in on top of that, we then use something that is called a quality control. Sometimes I see papers that do not know uh, what a quality control is. 
Well, you all know, uh, you, you have, must have heard about, <laughs> hopefully you all use quality controls, there are many different ways. So roughly 25% uh, of all the samples or all the runs in a good lab are 25 uh, are, are quality controls, for example, blank controls, the most important ones, but also, you know, if you have a plasma, there's NIST plasma you can buy, that's a standardized plasma, but also it's expensive, so you might want to use other quality controls, for example, commercial plasma that may change from, you know, like today and in five years, but uh, because they have a different group of people that they uh, analyze or sample. You can also make quality controls by, during the extractions, you take parts of it and then put it in a different pot and aliquot the pot, so you have an actual quality control pool of identical samples that you run, and then you randomize your actual samples. So if you do that, metabolomics becomes repeatable and reproducible. And it can be even beco and also become standardized. So we have published last year this paper where we took 155 identical plasma samples of a nutritional intervention study that we published before the biology on. And then we used these identical samples, we used identical sample preps, we did identical UPLCs, and then we used identical MS data processing, identical statistics, but we used nine different mass specs. Because some people tell you, like, you cannot do good science in, unless you have the fusion or whatever mass spec you, you know, heard about, the latest thing on, uh, the, the, um, presented at PitCon, right? This is not true. It's great to have these new mass specs, but you can also do great science with older mass specs. So there's some, there's some uh, hope for you. Uh, so we used here high resolution mass specs, and you these are principal components analysis of different people in, in colors and before and after intervention um, in, in, in the time course, so each of those people in the time course. And you see that even the samples in each mass spec, in each uh, additional effort, were even then on the same spot in the PCAs, which is remarkable. So that means we can really do precision analysis um, despite the variance between people, and we can follow the trajectory in this nutritional intervention. So it is possible, but you need to know your instrument. You know, so you cannot, and the, what we said in this paper, do never inject too much. Okay, if this is a tutorial, don't inject too much. You know, know your detector saturations. That is the single most important item um, when you run a mass spec. All right, if you do that, and, and then you have internal standards, um, you know, you can, for example, have a labeled uh, triglyceride, and then you, s you, you quantify this, and you, s you get differences. So in, in this run, on the SciX instrument, we had, you know, maybe two millimoles, uh, mi sorry, micromoles of this, and then here we had three and a half. So yes, there is a difference a little bit, because it's not the exact internal standard, right? But, you know, a class-specific internal standard, there is a variation, but you can say it's somewhere between two and four micromoles, um, and certainly not 20, and certain not, certainly not 0.1, right? So, so at least you can anchor your study that you publish to the rest of the future publications that people talk about when they talk about these compounds. All right, good, so the next thing is uh, error. So when we have many, many samples, in metabolomics you easily run 1,000 samples or more. The largest study we've run in my lab was 14,000 samples. So what you then have is, well, you get a, a dirty ion source, uh, you know, because source, you, you transfer capillaries, um, you need to change the columns, uh, maybe you change buffers, and so on. Um, so you get these, you, these, these, these drifts and, and jumps. Uh, the jump is when you do machine maintenance, and a drift is when something deteriorates over time. In red dots, these are QC samples. The gray dots are actually human samples. So um, you see that we have to correct this error. Um, the standard way to uh, was locally estimated scatter plot smoothing. Um, it's published uh, over, o and over and over again. The problem is then you sometimes overcorrect, uh, you know, during jumps, for example. And then you see that we have a little hump here, you know, that is kind of weird, right? You know, all of a sudden this group of humans would be different. You know, that's, I don't think so, right? Um, and you see, if you then do a um, um, PCA, a principal component analysis, that your quality control samples still have an unexplained variance. So if these are all the same samples, they should all be in a spot, and they were not in one spot. So we came up with a new method, it is a random forest. Random forest is great, uh, but it only works if you have many, many samples. So the minimum is 500 samples or more, or 50 con uh, quality controls or more. Um, and 
Uh, this is systematic error removal through random forest. We have not published it yet, but I have the publication on my desk, so we'll send it out after, after uh, language correction, I guess. <laughs> um, we learned, like half of the group here learned about how to do this. Um, all right, and then you see that there now the quality controls are on one spot and all the other samples, that's the rest is biological variation. That's what we are interested in. It's not an error, by the way. This is the, this is the stuff that we actually want to know about, right, and, and investigate. All right, so this is how do we, uh, you know, process data and how we quantify data. Now comes to the fun part. What is it? What are we talking about, right? So we have spectra, either GCMS and LCMS too. Um, and we see accurate masses um, and the element, we come to elemental formulas. Once you have elemental formulas, you can get a lot of isomers. If you go to databases, small molecule databases, you get somewhere between 50 to 5,000 isomers per elemental formula. So then you have to do in silico fragmentations to predict how they would fragment in a mass spec so that you predict the MSMS spectrum. In, in peptides, it's relatively easy, right? The peptides, you do the same. You say, like, I have this peptide sequence. I predict they will break at the peptide bond. Yay, yeah? So, you know, that's good. So it's great if you have a peptide bond. If you don't have a peptide bond, but something more complicated, it's not easy to predict. And that is the big, big trouble. Um, so, first of all, predi since predictions is hard, it it's would be great to gather all human knowledge in one place. Um, now, what, that's what we did, uh, funded by NSF and NIH. We uh, have MassBank of North America called MONA, also MassBank.us, very easy to remember. Um, we do not have all information there, but it's all information we find that is publicly inf uh, available. So that means not licensed libraries. The NIST 17 is a licensed library. It costs $5,000. You should totally buy it. It's a good library. Um, has lots of small molecules, uh, something 300,000 spectra or more, um, but only about 20,000 or so uh, LC MSMS spectra. So it's kind of really limited there. Um, the Metlin library is a licensed library. $15,000 from Wiley. So it's not, if you if you heard that Metlin is free, it's wrong, it's not free, right? Um, you, there's a website where you can put in one spectrum at a time, but not like on a whole chromatogram level. All right, so we said that's bad. You know, as scientists, we should share data and not keep data for ourselves and then in some kind of in-house nonsense. Uh, whenever I see in-house in publications, I get like cringe, okay? Because it means you don't want me to repeat your analysis, which is not science. Okay, so um, so you can go there. Um, so the idea is it takes spectra from any man, ma uh, manufacturer, but we have two requirements. A, you must have a mass spectrum. We do not put an NMR or whatever. And, and B, you must know the structure. We do not put in unknowns here. Right? These are the two minimal criteria to go into MONA. But maximum is, of course, you know, we invite people, encourage people to do a lot more in terms of metadata. You know, which instrument, which make model, which ionization uh, energy, which collision energy, which uh, or activation time, and so on and so forth. Did you use, did you use HPLC? If so, what kind of HPLC? What tension times? What markers? So there's so many things you can do. Point is, you get credit. Every mass spec uh, will, has an author, so you can actually use it in your merit actions, or um, you can be proud of it, and it will be your spectrum. It is your spectrum because we made, similar to the uh, chemical identifier key, uh, we led a um, um, consortium to make a spectrum identifier key called Splash. So far, we have 220,000 mass spectra for 75,000 compounds. So 75,000 compounds may sound good, but if you think about all of metabolome, it might be a million compounds out there. So that's why we have still tons of unknowns, right? Okay. Um, what else do we do? We have auto curation in that workflow. So we are not getting 12 people who cu curate entries. Uh, we rely on the scientists. So that's why if you upload something really, really bad, remember your name is associated with that spectrum, right? Okay, we, we, we try to catch the biggest and grossest errors, like if the structure doesn't match the precursor mass, or not only the precursor mass, but also like known adducts and maybe a dimer with a proton or a dimer with a sodium. So we, we look for those, but if it still doesn't flag, uh, doesn't, doesn't add up, we flag it and you know, say, well, that's not very reliable, we don't know what it is. Sometimes people do derivatization, especially in GCMS. 
So if people say, I have a trimethylcellulose uh, variant and they give us a structure, I would say, oh, trimethylcellulation, it works on acidic protons. So this is the thing that you actually look for, right? Um, so that is like with the acidic uh, protons replaced. So we do this automatically. We have a number of other um, rules and eventually then people can, down, uh, can, can you know, up download their spectra in various formats for various types of software. So as I said, similar as we used uh, the, uh, the chemical structure uh, for the Inchi key, we now came up with a, you know, every spectrum being represented by a unique mass spec identifier. Uh, we calculated that at least a trillion mass specs must be uploaded until we get the first collusion, you know, where, where all of a sudden you would have two identifiers that go for different spectra. The only difference is if it's a, if it's a spectrum is a very simple spectrum like one ion. If you have one ion, that's not a good spectrum anyway, you know, so that might collide with some, some, some other structure that would also come up with a fragment ion. Well, yeah, so there is, of course, um, some caveats to it. Um, so far, we have not published, I'll work on the publication uh, soon, um, but although we don't publish, we present at seminars like this one, and people have heard about it. So, so far, we have 21,000 unique users from 130 countries and 8,000 people have downloaded it. So, so that's very easy to use and, and mostly in the United States, but also in India, for example, China and other countries. Iceland and, uh, sorry, Greenland is a little empty there. Um, okay, maybe not so many mass spectrometers sitting there. Um, so, so this is all good, but what can you do with it? So once you have it, um, you can in integrate it in many other ways. So you can uh, integrate it in MS Dial, the software I showed you. Um, there is also uh, companies starting. So Broker is the first uh, company that started it, and I invite other companies to join, uh, both for uploads and downloads. Um, it's integrated in PubChem, so PubChem hosts it, so it doesn't go away even if I lose funding because some reviewers don't like me. Um, so PubChem will still host it, and also that's the idea. We have a coalition of servers, an international coalition, so that MassBank in Japan, MassBank in Europe would copy our data. We copy from them, they copy from us. We know where it's coming from through the splash key, the spectral identifier key. But it's also used in MZ Mine, um, and G uh, we got it from GNPS, and HNDB is there too. All right, so um, this is uh, how it would look like. So you can also say, well, I want, I want to only download a specific library, for example, only flavonoids, or only the HNDB library, which is like 4,000 spectra, right? Um, so you can do that, but you can also ask, I only want to download accurate mass spectra, or I only want to download Q-executive mass spectra. Um, so that you, there are metadata flags because if people say I have used a Q-executive, well, then you can download those, right? Or you can say Orbitrap, right? Um, so this is possible. You can also do it by, by the structure. So this is all the structures in, and since we have the Inchi key, we know which structures we have in the library. And if you were only interested in benzenoids, you'd say, well, give me all the benzenoids at 12,000, and within the benzenoids, I want to look at the 1,000 uh, phenols there. So you can download this spectra for those because you don't care for any other compound class. So you can either do the whole libraries or everything or just specific ones or just GCMS or, you know, so there's uh, uh, various ways to download um, and then you use it in the regular way. You use it in any type of mass spec software. This is a NIST uh, pep search, for example, um, or, or an MS Dial. So it's just a library you download and you put it in and then you say, oh yeah, I know the compound. That's all great, it's just this compound here. All right, so same thing here for, um, for MS Dial. So you see here this more complicated structure. You would not be able to predict it. Actually, we are not able to predict it. So we have to measure it. Um, and then you say, yeah, now I know what it is, um, hesperidin, um, which is a flavonoid. So we were interested in flavonoids because they're really hard to do. So we, we, we purchased uh, flavonoids. Uh, we purchased 2,000 natural products. Um, among them about 1,000 flavonoids, but also in that there were some terpene glycosides and some carboxylic acids, diterpenoids, <coughs> and so on. And the reason is they're so hard. Um, you didn't get any uh, publicly available spectra library, a little bit from RESPECT, which is in, in, in Japan, but not from the Weizmas, which is in Israel, but not public. Um, and we said, oh, great, great, great. So now we, we, we collect the spectra, um, and then and, and people can use a library. So this is how it looks like. So here we have a Q-executive, a 35 HCD, and here's a Q-executive 45, and you see, well, the 
parent ion is a little, sh you know, lower abundant than here. That makes sense, you know. And uh, by and large, you can easily easily compare them. That's great. Um, so you could download one, uh, you know, voltage, and you likely will use the same instrument. You know, even if you use a slightly different voltage, you will still be able to uh, identify this. The query genin. <laughs> okay, so that is all great, but now uh, some people have an old instrument. So some people have a linear ion trap, and so we we did 2,000 of all all compounds on a on a linear ion trap, and then we can now compare it against orbital ion trap. Well, these are both both ion traps, but they have vastly different ways to fragment and you know um, um, and put uh, comp um, ions uh, to measurement, and you now see that. Well, this is the same compound here, yeah, but you would not have guessed, and I would not have guessed. The score is awful. Its score suggests it's the same compound, but you look at the fragments and you're like, whoa, something is really odd here. Something cannot, it doesn't, doesn't work. And um, this is one of the problems. All these scoring systems were not developed for LCMS systems. So we have to develop new, s new ways. Um, so far, nobody has done it. So this is an unsolved problem. So I said, you know, there are unsolved problems, right? And then people say, well, you know, I have a QTOF. Can I use your library and uh, compare it to a QTOF? And then you look at that and you're like, no. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, I mean, even the accurate mass here is like 40 millidalton difference. So the nominal mass would match, but it's a different compound, a different fragment. Um, so, so you gotta have uh, different libraries. And that's why we have many, many spectra from different instruments. So one compound was different, different spectra. Um, and so we, we, we analyzed all 2,000 compounds on three different collision energies on a, on a, on a QTOF, but also on different um, HD voltages on a QXactive so that people get help um, no matter where you're from, right, and what you have. So then we had this idea. It's like, okay, great. Now we have multi-stage MS. Um, so we could take this, this, this uh, compound here um, and we would have an MSMS spectrum, and then we have an, you know, um, maybe or here we have an MSMS spectrum, and we have an MS to the three spectrum, right? So in principle, ions do not have memory. So it is as if we had injected this compound, now got an MSMS. So we thought like, oh, that is so cool because then we put in 2,000 natural products, but we get a lot more out of it. Um, that is fantastic idea. We did it on a linear ion trap because it, you can't do MS stage because we didn't have a fusion system. Um, and uh, then we were asking, well, can we, if we now add up all these ions, how would they hold up? And so now we compared um, all the fragments and MS5 for this molecule against all the fragments that we get from a fusion. And again, they don't add up. Right. So again, uh, you know, you can't just go from one uh, mass spec to the other mass spec because the fragmentation mechanisms, at least for natural products, are different. And this is the hard part in, in metabolomics, at least for natural products. But not everything is a natural product. Okay. So how do we now identify compounds that are not in libraries? Right. That's a really hard task. Like now we have thousands of compounds, and I give you one example of a publication that we tried to publish, where we, we published, but not this graph. So the reviewer said, you cannot publish unknowns because unknowns are unknown. You cannot publish them. You can't talk about, you know. And I said, well, but we do have mass spec similarity. Look, you know, these are down-regulated, and they are mass spec, sim this is by mass spec similarity, they are close, right? And I know the, some known compounds are amino acids. Um, so these are variants of amino acids, but they didn't allow us to, to, to analyze this. I said, well, you know, I still still said, but w the, the truth is, whenever you run a metabolomic experiment, you get a lot of unknowns that are differentially expressed in, compared to your study design. And we got to identify them or, the we, or we ignore the true biology that's hidden there. So how do we do this? All right. So first of all, uh, 10 years ago, 12, 11 years ago, we published the so-called seven golden rules. There are still some mass spec vendors who don't uh, obey to the seven golden rules. We call them golden rules because they're really golden. They're not platinum, but they're golden, right? So there are rules, they're not laws. So there's something rules like, you do reg you know, usually you don't have more than four protons per carbon. And if your you know, software gives you out something like C10H50, uh-uh, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> mathematically correct, you know, biologically, chemically incorrect, right? And, and other rules, like seven golden rules. <coughs> um, with that, and including isotope ratios and whatnot. 
you get a, a good, good, good constraints. Um, we then have an in silico workflow, um, including uh, structure constraints. Uh, for example, the number of protons, very, very important. We published libraries for compounds that are much easier to predict, like lipids. Lipids are my friends. Lipids are almost like peptides. You know, they they fragment here at the uh, at those acyl groups, and then you. You know, have here the experimental here to predict that it works, and that's why there's so many uh, search engines now for lipidomics because they all rely on the predictability of lipids, roughly. Um, then we published something where said, "Oh, well, not everything is a lipid," and so people used different types of prediction tools. Uh, for example, um, for 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 more complex compounds, um, they used the bond strength. They used uh, the standard dynamic differences between products and ions. They're, you know, used rules, so there's published rules, right? We also um, have MS2 analyzer, um, just like bo going for rules that are published and see how often these rules are true. Um, and this is all great, but it ignores things like rearrangements. And McLefferty is, a, is a my, my favorite mass spectrometrist of all times, McLefferty. You know, he, he pointed out a couple decades ago that there are rearrangements in mass spec. Um, and so we allowed for proton rearrangements in our uh, software that we uh, wrote together with uh, um, Hiroshi Tsugawa and others. Um, first here, and then we used it again. Um, and in this way, we also have penalty rules. So, you know, if something that, you know, cannot be explained, for example, through proton rearrangements, um, you know, um, would get penalties. And then we go to from the from the formula to the structures, and then we rank the structures that, that come out of all these isomers. We use this tool for both GCMS and LCMS. So this is a publication we did last year. Uh, for example, for these epimetabolites, these methylated compounds. So we purchased them, and we you know then looked at the spectra and compared to the predicted spectra. And sometimes it works pretty nicely, except for this ion you see here. This ion was not predicted, right? This ion group was not predicted, so it doesn't work 100%. Nothing works 100%, right? It's an algorithm, right? And then some others, you know, worked also fine, but again, more compounds were not correctly uh, predicted. The prediction would include ion intensities. So it's not just the presence, but also the relative abundance of these. Um, we now can, um, um, you know, um, went one step ahead, and now we used uh, an integration of MS Dial with MS Finder. Um, so MS Dial is now uh, capable of using any LCMS from any vendor, any MSMS, data dependent or data independent, also GCMS. And GCMS is different because it does not MSMS, it's electron ionization, so you ionize and fragment at the same time, right? That's different. So that was a little harder to do. And then we compared for GCMS here, for example, against standard or you know software, and it showed that we can do just as good as the best software on the market, um, and it works, right? Even for co uh, co-eluting abundant compounds and so on. So this is all nice, but the question now is, which compounds do we try to identify? So we have MS Dial that does the data deconvolution for any GCMS or LCMS. We have MS Finder that can predict ions, but we have thousands of unknowns. Right? Where do we start? Right? We can't always be right. And for that one, we use Binvestigate. Binvestigate lets you investigate the bins that we have, or bins are spectra, that we have collected over the last 20 years in our laboratory uh, for uh, about 2,500 studies that we have conducted in the last 20 years in uh, 150,000 different uh, chromatograms. Um, and so then what you get if, you know, um, it, so far it was only for GCMS, guess what? We'll try to do LCMS next, well, which is a little harder to do. Um, so we had unknowns, like this unknown. And this unknown, you look at that, where is it found and how abundant it is, and it's found in intestinal and fecal matter in both in humans and animals, also in yeast and bacteria, and it's also found in human, you know, s uh, serum and plasma, also in animal serum and plasma, and much lower abundant in tissues. So it looks to me as a biological idea that this is an unknown that comes from the microbiome, but it's excreted into the plasma. So that makes it interesting to these people who talk about microbiome all the time, right? And then we have another unknown. Here's an unknown that was really abundant in cancer cells and in cancer tissues. It's found in other tissues, but really low abundant, right? This is the idea how to use a database. And this is why we need to standardize uh, you know, metabolomics 
reporting and also collecting and using it. So I've done it for myself for 20 years, and now we try to do it also for the for the rest of the community. Um, so that's kind of cool. So now that now we have this compound, what do we do about it? Um, so we can, uh, you know, f use our methods now, and we say, well, this is unknown. is C10, H15, and 209P. Um, we did both in GCMS and LCMS. With that formula and the um, ability to know um, something about structure, and we use here labeled reagents to say, well, this co unknown compound had four acidic protons, not three, not five. So you can eliminate m many, many uh, impossible isomers. Um, and that's great, and we did that, and we came up with nothing. Okay, so the databases didn't have any compound that did that for us, right? So that what we do. So then we increase the database, and we publish that in 15. So we basically say, well, people always, you know, in, in these databases, there's only known compounds, right? So what if it's a really unknown? Well, it might be a variant of something that is known. So like an epimetabolite, a methylated, glucuronidated, hydroxylated, and so on. Um, so we took the CAG library and had operators, uh, chemical operators, based on a substructure that would either fragment it or methylate it or so on, and make a new hypothetical library. Well, so we called it uh, metabolic in silico expansion, or MINE. So with this MINE database, we found compounds um, that um, could be the unknown, and indeed it's methyl UMP. So we then synthesized the compound, um, or actually my collaborators, of course, synthesized the compound, um, and put it in the both GCMS and LCMS, and we see, well, it worked, right? So this unknown uh, was now identified by, by the mass spec, um, but you still say, well, 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 it could be methylated at another position, it gives the same spectrum, it's isomers. So therefore, we also synthesized the other isomers and ran it not only on the mass spec, but also on the LC, and you know, our N-methyl UMP um, was correctly identified both um, by LC and by GC and on, uh, on the mass spec and as a retention time. So this is all I wanted to tell you, but there's many things I did not tell you because of time. So I did not tell you about the most exciting things uh, that happened today. Um, iron mobility, yay, yeah? So if you have really complex samples, uh, you know, two-dimensional chromatography is really difficult. You know, for those of you who have done 2D LC, I mean, it does work in proteomics to some extent, it's really difficult. So LC iron mobility mass spec gives us another dimension, which potentially could give us a lot more information, and people publish a lot. Um, so then we have the rolling exclusion list, I call it the Rolex. Um, you know, so uh, some companies put up new instruments out there and then some other people, um, you know, uh, just talked about it. And this is from a paper from Florida. Um, Rick, uh, uh, Tim Garris and others, um, they had a little R script. So you can use it for, for on your mass spec, which, an, which is an R script. So basically exclude all ions that have been fragmented in the last run and then you go to the next run and get more ions and more more, more good mass spectra. Um, Steve Stein has, uh, you know, uh, improved the way to get ideas of uh, classes of compounds through MS Hybrid Search. Um, it's already implemented in the NIST software, and MS Hybrid Search doesn't identify the compound, but it gives you a compound name that is typical for the class of compounds it represents. So that we call it in metabolomics the so-called MSI Level Three annotations. So it's not like identified by, by a standard, it is not just a match in an MS MS library, but it's a good guess for the chemical class or the type of compound you're looking at. And then, you know, we, I love predictions, to so predict the future is hard. Um, so we will use quantum chemistry modeling because these are laws, I hope. Um, then we will get more retention time predictions and more uh, substructure information. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude. Um, you get free mass spectra, free the mass spectra, free the chromatograms, massbank.us, free software, MS Dial, MS Finder, so much more. Um, and one example of a, um, of a uh, compound, uh, we have uh, 17 mass specs uh, um, in my lab. We have uh, just last year done 500 studies. Uh, we run, f actually next week we have our own course, but it's booked out. Um, so we, have four, we run four professional courses a year. Um, and I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators, specifically Hiroshi Tsugawa from Riken. He's a, he's a genius. Um, I don't know. Uh, Sishuan Lai, who now works for SAMO. 
um, good for her. Um, and uh, Thomas Czajka, who did the repetition analysis, Tobias Kind in informatics, Dinesh Baropal on Cambridge, and the programming team. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. All right. Do we have any questions? I'd like to ask Oliver. Mike's got one. Or? Excellent talk, Oliver. Um, if one steps back and asks, um, there are two terms that define a proteome or metabolome. It's the dynamic range and the diversity. And that's, has anyone systematically compared the, both of those for everything from E. coli up to human and plants? In other words, is there any relationship between the complexity of a metabolome and a proteome. I mean, we always assume there is, but we know of, ex of, of differences as well. Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah. So, so first of all, it depends on the species, I, th I think. It depends on the species. So in human, the metabolome is by definition undefined because we eat, okay, and we have microbes. So, you know, that's why in a cell you can define it, in yeast and so on. So it's much easier in a cell than in an organism. Um, secondly, um, there are some papers where people use the literature, so lit data mining from the literature. Uh, they, they usually we call it then the exposome, but the exposome includes the metabolome, right? Because we're kind of exposed to our own metabolites in a, in a way. Um, we will publish a paper soon about the complete human uh, exposome, including the metabolome. Right, but other people have published before, uh, for example, um, dynamic range versus co you know concentrations versus diversity uh, for the exposome in human blood. Um, so that in you know with a focus on drugs versus endogenous metabolites versus food compounds and so on. So that's published by Rappaport and others, but not systematically declined. Not people didn't like look genome size versus metabolome size. In roughly E. coli, it doesn't have so many, right? Roughly, a plant has a lot, right? <laughs> you know, but that doesn't help a lot, you know? And, and we are strong believers in modifications, so a single nucleotide modification in a plant can give a whole array of new compounds, like in isoprenoids, for example, right? So, yeah. Anything else? I think, uh, I think we were all probably in need of a break. We've, I fear I overscheduled your morning. Um, so what we'll do is we will, um, we're scheduled to come back at 1.45. I propose we come, we reconvene at 2 to give you a little more time to get something to eat. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. All right. So let's come back at 2. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you.